Hello, and welcome back to Platform Enterprise, a podcast for people who are pissed off with capitalism. I'm your host, Rachel Donald. I'm an investigative journalist and a writer. You can find some of my work over at platformenterprise.com, where, importantly, you can sign up to get these podcast episodes delivered to your inbox every week. On this show, on this week's show, is German artist Linda Havenstein, with whom I had the most amazing discussion about art, language, capitalism, uh, metaphysics, and the tension of being an artist within an art market. This is one of my favorite episodes to date. I absolutely adored speaking with Linda, and we'll definitely have her back on the show to discuss her incredible work in further detail. On that note, you can find some of it at lindahavenstein.com and listen on to get her upcoming exhibition dates and locations at the end of the show. This conversation gave me so much energy and inspiration, and I hope it touches you. If you enjoy it, please give the show a five-star rating and leave a comment to let us know what you think. Thank you. All right, everyone. Thank you. Enjoy the show. Linda, thank you so much for coming on Platform Enterprise. It is a real pleasure to have you on the show today. Thank you very much for having me. It's an honor and pleasure on my side. So tell me, tell the listeners, uh, you are an artist, I think, from having seen your work, a conceptual artist? Yeah, yeah, like I think conceptual hits the point, but it's a kind of like old term. So I just use the term interdisciplinary. And I say that I work a lot with ideas. So I, I started with ideas and narratives. Mm-hmm. And then I just use all kinds of media to, to deal with them. And often transport them from one media to the other. Why, why is conceptual kind of an old term now? It's, it's a kind of like, it's often when you say it, to, it kind of like refers to this to this kind of like thing that was like happening in the, in the 60s, 70s. And then often it doesn't really, how can I say it? Um, the thing, the majority of the works that are very well known within the realm of conceptual art do not really hit what I think I'm doing. Mm-hmm. Um, I think, I mean, also like, I think the, the artist that is like, is called conceptual and is most closely to what I'm doing is I think Mark Lombardi, okay. who has um, who has been drawing maps of international deals, like big deals that um, like big financial deals and and mm. trade deals and stuff like that. Um, and it's called a conceptual artist, but yeah, because I also use art as a thinking process. Yeah. yeah, and I think that is closest to, but it, that's also called a conceptual artist. So yes and no, I just don't <laughs> identify so much with the term. So yeah. Okay, interdisciplinary artist, interdisciplinary. I have I have so many questions for you. Like I've been thinking, I've been thinking about this interview all week, and I've been like, you know, I kind of want to ask you about like your childhood and how you got into it, and then what it's like, you know, being like a modern, you know, a, a real life artist, and you know, this stage of kind of post-capitalist or you know capitalist devouring itself society um how you choose your mediums and all of this like oh no, i just think uh interdisciplinary artists in particular fascinating okay like, thank you i'm, I'm very yeah. excited <laughs> <laughs> so so let's start with your childhood no um, how did how did you get into it because i mean you know it's not it's not fine art in like, it's not painting or drawing. It's not Instagram. It's like, it's extremely idea centric work. How, how do you get into that? It actually, like, I have to start with my child. No, I don't, but <laughs> <laughs> um, it's actually like, I, I was, I did not study art, but um, I studied Japanese studies and uh, literature and all kinds of like things that are more within like uh, cultural theories and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And um, while doing so, I was like researching on a project and I was um, dealing a lot with uh, environmental activists and um, trying to put together a major theory of how I can, like, there was an Okinawa in Japan and like how I can bring together like images of like post-colonial images and tourism 
and environmental activism and all of that stuff. And I just realized in, in a lot of instances that I won't be able to describe and analyze the thoughts and the experiences that I have in language and only in text. Because if you write a thesis, you're writing a thesis. And if you're lucky, you can also submit some images and maybe mm -hmm. like do crafts and whatsoever. But um, this didn't seem to be enough for me. Mm -hmm. um, because it does not um, encompass the entire experience that you have, like all of the process that are happening within you that you're maybe not really able to, to articulate that are maybe not just um, very conscious to yourself, but that are a great motivator for people eventually. Um, so there's this like large field of unknown motivations um, and of things that you just w later on develop in your own thinking process that I think cannot be captured by text and by language. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to just give it a go and... Um, do some works about it. I did some video works about it. That I, yeah. That was, yeah, no, that was the thing. It was like leaving yeah. language, going into like a more um, human experience kind of like approach. God, I think we could speak about this for like three hours. Right, okay. Why was language for you... Um, because what it sounds like, it sounds like you wanted to kind of express like the primordial feelings, um, the the whatever precedes a thought or an action. Like, I don't know whether it's emotion. I don't know if, it, you know, if we can just call it like human experience or whatever. Um, and yeah, language is like a very, very structured thing. But at the same time, like video is a really, really structured thing. So, Yeah. So was it like it was was it the the visual aspect, being able to work with with images and with film, that seems able to express more of what you were seeking than you know, grammatically based <laughs> language. Yeah, and it was yeah the visual thing, and also that um, if you do if you would describe a situation, you have um, limited capacities because language is time-based and you can only mm -hmm. you can only describe so and so many things in the same order as you perceive an image that you see where right? a lot of things are happening at the same time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they all get into your brain and you process that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you will not be able to do the same thing with language Like you know, you know the the, the simultaneousness, the this the kind of like the spatial level of image that just encompasses much more information than um, all of the interpretations that I'm putting already into the language right now. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's like you you can't really receive language without also having your own projection of whatever it is on top, or it's extremely hard to to receive or to write anything that tries to break away from that. So yeah, like image, it's like uh, hashtag unfiltered. You know? <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. Isn't that a whole level of irony as well? Wow. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely, absolutely. <gasps> okay, so, all right, okay. So you were meant to be writing a thesis and you chose instead to to make this creation of with videos and and then what happened? So, I mean, I also wrote the thesis and I submitted mm. it, but for me, much it was a very liberating thing to just also start to do the video pieces mm -hmm. on, um, on the research that I was doing. And then I just went on rolling with it because it made much more sense to me. I don't know if, I'm, if I was good at like carrying over my ideas with that. I don't know if people understand it the same way as I was trying to understand it through this work of like putting it into a video. But for me, it felt much more correct in a way to do it that way. Hmm. 
And what kind of themes have you um, explored th through your work in, in your career? Has it been sort of similar stuff or? I mean, I, I think I look at the world in a very, so like people call my work political, but I think this is just like the, the stuff that I'm thinking about all the time or like the certain topics. My, my thinking process just stops at certain processes that I think mm -hmm. to further go into. Like I have these works that are dealing with gentrification or just generally how we treat or the ideas of environment and about the human bodies and all this kind of stuff that you can, of course, like read in a, in a, in a way that can be labeled as being political, but it's also just a very human thing, right? Um, yeah. So... Yeah, I think I'm, I'm just picking up a lot on, on, on topics that are labeled political. Why kind of um, a resistance to, to put that label on it yourself? Because it's very flat. It's, it's for one thing, it's, it's very flat. It doesn't encompass all the, I mean, like, for example, talking about capitalism. Capitalism is not only something that lives within the realm of politics, of course not. But it also encompasses so, so much other things like culture. Mm -hmm. It changes our bodies. It changes everything around us. Mm -hmm. So just calling it political because I'm dealing with capitalism is just like leaving out all, all of the other important things that can be said about it. Well, all right. I'm going to try and speak about something that I don't remember. So the, the conversation might be completely derailed. But um, there's that quote, you know, like every, everything is political. Um, and there's a dictionary, I think it might be the Merriam-Webster dictionary, Ugh, I can't remember exactly, but the definition of politics, like the very first one is like the art of building or maintaining relationships between groups or individuals. Should we look it up? That's a very interesting... Hang on. Merriam-Webster. Because I remember I found it years ago. And I was like, well, that changes everything. Yeah, totally. But it's also interesting that it, that it leaves out this, this idea of statehood and everything. No? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, okay. So there's a couple of definitions, like the art or science or government, the art or science concerned with winning and holding control over a government, you know, political affairs, da, da, da. And 5A, the total complex of relations between people living in society. That's interesting. Isn't it, though? That's very nice. Because why should, you know, politics just be viewed as party politics? Absolutely. Like, like capital P politics and... Like, exactly yeah. exactly and what if we drew it away from like you know i subscribe to um the only socialist magazine in the united kingdom tribune and i was really excited when i got the subscription and i downloaded all the back issues and i went through them and it was all just about party politics you know capital p capital p and i was like this isn't this isn't about people this isn't about people's lived experience it's barely even about policy it's just about you know bickering in westminster um so, I don't know, for, for me personally, I, I, I like the word political, I like thinking that everything is political, I think that it's empowering also to be like, yeah, you, yeah, you can be involved in politics, like, buying, you know, where you choose to buy your, um, I was going to say carton of eggs, but people are vegan, where you choose to buy your vegetables, <laughs> you know, it's a political act, who you choose to be friends with, it's a political act, where you choose to live, and, you know, the modern world, it's... Yeah, I agree. I totally agree. I mean, there's, there's this way of like naming things correctly and just dealing with the terms in a more normalized way, as you just said. And there's this other, there's this other way of dealing with it, like in, especially in the art world, like saying things are political are, it's just often a description that kind of like ends the discussion is like, okay, we're not going to talk about more about it because it's political and that's the only thing that it is. So within, especially within the art market kind of things, it's not really, um, 
how can I say it? It's not a very popular thing to say that something is political. Def yeah, I mean, in so many circles, it's unpopular or it's seen as difficult to enter into or it's kind of almost like, yeah, it's this reason to shelve, you know, like it's too it's too complex or it's not representative of what's happening or it's politicking, you know, whenever you you put that ing with the k on it like when politics becomes politic with the k i'm like yeah, yeah that's yeah. the bullshit and it's like so this is what it is and we're not going to talk about it further because this is like something that has to be talked about by someone else like by polit politics is made by politicians kind of like things you know or like you know <sighs> bullshit yeah but. see oh see to me that's that's just not it at all you know like, yeah, party party politics and policy is extremely important because that's kind of like the way through. Or at least, you know, if you want to enact change on like a really, really high, fast level, you're going to need to do that. But like, it's it's everyone. It's not just sort of this group of anonymous people in a big stone room making decisions about the relationships of everyone for, you know, it's all of us together. And I just, I think that's, yeah, it's such a more empowering thought for me personally. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm. But let's talk about the other kind of politics in the art world. I mean, you know, you sent me some of your work to prepare ahead. I love it. I absolutely love it. In another life, if I had the, if I had the stomach for it, or if I had a, the confidence or the pulse, I would love love to be an um, an artist in the way that you are interdisciplinary. Um, and a lot of it is dealing with capitalism. So let's talk about that. How complicated is it to be an artist in a capitalist world, making art that is distinctly anti-capitalist, but having to find a mode of living or a mode of, you know, sharing one's work? That's a very big question. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we got time. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Ugh. <clears throat> of course it's not easy and of course it's like you especially if you're trying to deal with I mean there's certain levels of art market and um, of art institutions and how they work like the big ones that are making the headlines are mostly going along with collectors who who just have in my opinion too much money mm -hmm. you know like this is other saying that every every billionaire is a system failure, and I totally subscribe to that. Oh, that's nice. Uh, yeah, and um, where also art is just a means of money laundering, or just to like don't pay taxes and all of that stuff. So, so this, this is this one level, and um, of course a lot of also gallerists who try to to make it in the market, they kind of subscribe to that. They don't want to be you know, things are things that are too vocal about not agreeing with certain things within the art market are not very well regarded. But then there's also a lot of works that are just, you know, a little bit politically are just they don't write like big sentences on that on top of their works but you can read it in a kind of like anti-capitalist way and that that can be owned again by people who have gained their wealth and their all of the means to buy these artworks um in a way to make some kind of absolution you know like oh i understand that the system is fucked and then i buy this work and I use the work in a way that you can use it to don't pay taxes and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, so there is this kind of like embracing anti-capitalist thought or positions even within the big art world and the big art market. And then there is, of course, also um, an art market that caters more to like small, small time collectors people who just really like work and want to have it and don't turn around and flip it on auction just to make more money out of it. Um, so there's like these different tiers to it, but there's of course like the big shiny figures that everyone looks to mm -hmm. in the art world that are making the most money, the big collectors that are having the most money and like 
paying most of the money for for like the most uh, expensive works and um to position yourself within that is, is a little bit difficult like because you have to kind of like pretend that you're not seeing that or that you're not part of the system which of course you are um but at the same time not being vocal about it just feels wrong mm. you know if art is a way to investigate the world and a way to express your view onto the world and how you how you deal with it then just not being vocal about this very very big part of what we are seeing all of the destruction that we're seeing um, the things that are discussed about it's just not an option I think yeah definitely so you, I, uh, you people wrap it a lot no like they they wrap it nicely to not be too controversial it's um like the sanitization of literature or art um into in order to fit it into a market is so fucking dangerous um and even like splitting them into all of these different categories like I have a pal and like years ago we were talking about like the role of the artist um and versus the role of the philosopher and I was like this isn't an either or thing they, they work together like you see this throughout history like art comes first like the artist makes something that is kind of this investigation of human expression and like really really primal and then the philosopher comes along and tries to like you know figure it out and put the piece together and that kind of often opens up or yeah opens up or finds the key to kind of like a new system like because it's very system you know systemized philosophy um and they have to work together and like what you, you see that in the academy like you know there's a lot of philosophy of film or philosophy of art or whatever but like the fact that in life you know artists and philosophers aren't kind of given the space to like work together to try and grapple with and like complete the cycle of from you know, the feeling of there's something wrong and I need to figure out what it is to maybe figuring it out and offering like a solution. It's extremely dangerous. Like I, I find it wild that literature and art um, are seen as like commodities. And I think it's like when they're like sort of the, the first and last gatekeepers to, you know, change in society and yeah. God hope. <laughs> But at the same time, like, especially, like, I mean, it's, um, I don't, like, I can talk for Germany where there is, like, a large, for example, the performing arts, they are mostly operating state funded or, like, they're funded by the city or whatsoever because there's, like, they don't have any commodified goods that they can sell on. Yeah. yeah. So they cannot easily participate in the art market. There's no, there's no market for that. So they operate in a... Um, in a kind of like space and in a kind of like little microculture where it's totally okay to be political. It's absolutely right to discuss current issues, to bring in all of these topics, all of these bodies that cannot be commodified and all, all of these things um, that you cannot see so well and so much in, in the visual arts. And that is because people really strive to be participating in the art market because this is seen as a form of access and there's less and less um, options to to survive of museum funded shows mm. so it's so like it's a very highly like okay like predator type of capitalist kind of system where you have like a lot of losers who are not able to survive and just very few of them that are like in the in the spotlight yeah and it, you know it's funny I've, I've not thought about this ever in my life but just you saying it right now like when you think about the um the art world that is still most open to to amateurs and to just like fun and human it's it's the performing arts there's like adult amateur theater groups all around in every single city there's loads of them and they just get together and they you know make stuff and put it on and it's for fun and i wonder if that's because it's not um uh, an art form that is easily commodified exactly as you say yeah, you know <laughs> so there's more room for more people yeah exactly and like for a totally different way of like 
of thinking of how you like I, I realize that myself when I'm when I'm working on things I'm always thinking about like what will be the outcome of it what kind of object will be at the end how can this be maybe produced in a larger series whatsoever you always think in a kind of production line almost like you know oh. you would do like as an industrial kind of like person like how many of that can I make how can this be feasible and it's um yeah, it's like reducing the possibilities of what you can do from the very beginning because you already think mm -hmm. in this kind of like terms. It's gonna be like... Do you, um, are there works that you make um, to survive? Like works that you make that can be sold in order to, you know, then be able to fund other projects or, or not? Yeah. These are, these are also the, like at the moment I'm doing painting and uh, painting is really big at the moment. Figurative painting, I'm not making figurative painting, but I'm doing this, this larger series about, um, about code, like codified language, mm -hmm. where I um, incorporate messages in, in Morse code and in binary code and all kinds of things around us that you don't see that there is a message behind it there's a concrete meaning behind it it just looks like something some kind of surface or like a stack of clothes mm. or like a stack of like a box full of apples but there's actually a message in there a very concrete meaning and um, doing these works and I'm preparing for a show there will be some sculptures that are like not so easy to be sold and there will be paintings because paintings sell the easiest and this is also something that the gallerists would need they would need something that they can sell at the end and if you don't have something like that it's going to be difficult to make a show in the first place right okay yeah there's a whole system yeah you forget sometimes like when you're not involved in the world at all like yeah there's a whole ecosystem of the art world that needs its bits to survive how do you feel about that though you know being aware that there is a certain medium that you need to produce more of um just in order to sell um i mean like the this is also such a it's actually also like such a capitalist kind of like thinking but like the, the hope is that at some point you're going to be so successful that you don't need to have this thinking anymore you know they're just going to take yeah. whatever you want yeah so get on top of the line in order to, you know. Um, I don't know. I mean, like, I'm, it's just, I started painting just, like, recently, so I don't know how this is going to, at the moment it's still fun, but I can also imagine that it, at the point where it starts to feel wrong that I'm just going to stop it all together again. Right, okay. And what do you think the solution is, you know, for... Maybe not in an ideal world, but do you think that there's a certain path or option that the, the art world, and I, I also by that mean, you know, literature and everything involved in, you know, human expression needs to do or a path that we need to go down in order to free future generations from this kind of, yeah, capitalist thinking? Because it's true, it's, it's, it's an awful thing to sort of be, you know, an ideological person and try to live your life by what you think is right and benefit your community and then feel like... Well, yeah, but I just, like, if I do this for a time, then, you know, I just need to do it for then, and, and then I'll be able to live completely purely. I'm sure Bezos has that exact same thinking, like, yeah, no, I don't, I don't treat my workers that well, but it's just for now. <laughs> it's just till I make the trillion. <laughs> I think this is happening in all of the beehives. Um, I was, I was really, I was also, like, thinking about like listening to your podcast and I was um, <sighs> how can I put that like recently I've been I also don't remember which conversation it was but I, I was having a conversation with someone who um, I actually don't remember what it was about but we kind of like the discussion ended at this point where we just realized that um, at a certain point when you have when you put all of the evaluation into into numbers, it's also a little bit like this Kraber kind of, like David Kraber kind of thinking, where as soon as you, you put numbers on something, um, it completely changes the entire system. 
like as soon as you as you make artworks as you evaluate them by the selling price then all of the other kinds of evaluations kind of become less important mm -hmm. and um, I think I mean this is just just general direction that I see a lot and more and more um, is that well let's let's go back to my childhood maybe that's really interesting to start there <laughs> <laughs> so I was I was I was born in GDR, so in in you know like the eastern part of Germany, when it was still when it was still uh, socialist, and of course it didn't stop to be that way within people's minds when the wall came down. So this space and this community that I was growing up in the nineties and the two thousands was still had all of their socialization within a socialist country where value and also how you and also hierarchies were not built by money there was a different way of like um, getting access to things that you couldn't get mm -hmm. um, there was a different way of evaluating things and also people it was a more complex system like things of value were more complex um, because money at some point really didn't mean a lot because there was no there was not a lot to buy like there was limited access to to goods and um, to food like certain kinds of food at the very end of it and you would have to have connections in order to get them right. and it was a kind of um, it was a kind of also a little bit like David Kraber I'm coming back to him all the time but um, mm -hmm. is describing this is like you do favors to someone in advance because you know they're going to be in a position much later on where, where you will need their favors so um yeah yeah because it was like you live in this little town you you no one's going to run away anyway and you just um it's like this kind of like favor exchange thing like mm -hmm. you get goods and you give something back as soon as when you need it. um it's a relationship, relationship. It's just a relationship, but like with a lot of people that actually don't know each other so well. It's just like in an mm. entire city, it's like this this kind of like thing. This is how it worked eventually. And um, so the and all of my family was, of course, like social, like getting their socializations within that kind of space and also were working in their in their thinking in, in that kind of like dealing with community, how you how you treat people, how you evaluate someone wor someone's worth in a way, a person that you don't know. Um, and then growing up, capitalist thinking was rather, I mean, of course they all knew it, but, and they all learned it, but it was like rather thin. Right. Um, and I, there's still spaces like that. I was like at the lake recently where, um, where there's on a, on a tiny island is a beer garden and they have a monopoly there, right? They could mm -hmm. like charge whatever they want, but they don't do that because yeah. they cater to the community. And um, I was growing up with a much, I don't know, diversified value and evaluation system. And I see all of this like being exchanged simply for numbers and for yeah. money value and of course also didn't start to make art because I wanted to create the longest numbers most of the digits that was not my my goal you know um, and I see that everything is kind of like how can it's like like simplified towards towards the monetary kind of like value that it has and I think not going back, but like somehow putting a different kind of like, I don't know if it goes with inventing words, so I don't know, like creating a more complex evaluation system again, that is not like where money is not playing such, or numbers. It's not about money, but it's about like the digits and the numbers. The numbers are just not the only kind of like value that is assigned to something. Um, might be creating, a, I don't know, like, a better system or like maybe a way out I don't know 
Absolutely. I'm sorry, I just, that was a very long answer. <laughs> no, I love that. That was absolutely fascinating. And we're going to get into it every single bit. Um, but I th- I think I think you're completely right. I think um, it's it's one of my, just an aside, it's one of my like fears about um, the way that climate change um, is being capitalized on, you know, by making, save the forests by making them carbon sinks and offer carbon credits. And it's like, that. that's the beginning of the end when you put a financial value on something because that's how they got deforested in the first place. So horrible. Um, mm. Yeah, there's so many more reasons to value something, but I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's that numbers are so simple and then human relationships and community and exchanges of value are so complex that our lazy ass brains just grasp on to like the one universe, you know, because it's true. Numbers are uni- universal. They're the only language that's universal. It's the only thing that can be globalized. You know, whereas a word is going to have so many different meanings across different cultures and, and what we choose to value, what ob- objects or behaviors, you know, they're all valued differently across cultures. So maybe that's why it's become the language of, of export and import. Um, and I, I, I don't know how we do it. I don't know how we um, value, see all the sides of value. I mean, like we're we're so quick to fall into binary thinking black or white this or that uh, again probably laziness yeah i think yeah like an unquantifiability no mm. like very easy quantifiability and uh there's this one thing that is always that museums or like other other institutions give you when they don't pay you is exposure yeah, you know, like there's like this, <laughs> these two things that artists are are paid in is money and fame. So, I was thinking to make like an entire kind of like system out of it, where you kind of like have quantifiable like tokens of fame or exposure that you kind of like um, as a kind of like fake bank or something like that mm. to not them because for them it's easy to say like exposure I don't I, you get exposure but it's like no but I want like 3.5 exposure exposure <laughs> not just like 1.2 exposure you know like it, it makes it as easy and as uh, stupid as money is you know just to turn this yeah. all around just like this unquantifiable kind of like easiness that they get with not paying artists um but I, I think it's become um, more common because of the quantifiability of social media, because that's like a it's a big influencer thing like, oh, you know, please let me eat my meal here for free because I have 50,000 followers and I'll post you on my story or whatever, you know, like and that because that's interesting. Suddenly it does become quantifiable in a way. And it's not about quality because before it'd be like, you know, I can introduce you to this person who's like at the top of whatever pyramid or maybe has a lot of money or is big in art collector or whatever. Now it's not about that. It's like I can introduce you to these 50,000 random people and you just got to make do with it what you will. Like Exactly. <laughs> the whole system has just become so absurd. Yeah. And I also love that you can, I mean, like, I had so many conversations also with other friends who are, like, all the time guessing how Instagram is changing their algorithm so they can yeah. fake the system. Yeah. And everyone is starting to think like algorithms. And it's so mm-hmm. funny. Mm. It's, it's so scary. Like, see, with this <laughs> podcast, you know, like, I, I put a lot of work into this. Um, and I'm very grateful that all you amazing people are willing to give me an hour of your time. Um, <laughs> uh, but like, you know, I've got pals that are like, yeah, but you need to be marketing it. It's like, you, I cannot explain to you just how soul destroying that is, the concept of marketing this or the fact that I don't have the hours to figure out how to market it. You know, like I'm just going by community here. If people like it, they will share it. And like, that's what I want to be involved in which absolves me of the necessary effort that it would take. But I, like, I don't know how to do it. And I don't want to. I really I really don't want to. I don't want to give fucking Zuckerberg any more of my content, any more of my fucking copyright. Like, he doesn't give me shit. I wrote this thing a couple of weeks ago about, like, algorithm versus art and how it's um, pulling on, like, French philosophy, Baudrillard like um, simulacra and simulacrum, you know, and like what the thing of the thing or like the, the, 
the imitation of the imitation of, and how like we're all playing into it you know like if um and it's not just people trying to mimic success like like you said painting's popular right now so like yeah there's a there's a rational logic to that like okay yeah i'm gonna i'm i'm gonna find something in that that i like because it, it makes sense that's logical but then you put under the the other kind of um layer of this nowadays which is that something that's popular then say amazon's algorithm like with a book will promote it and then they'll start to promote other things that are like it and then people will start to commission things exactly like that thing in order to tap into its success and then the algorithm will keep perpetuating itself and it's like well where does the original thing start where is the beginning and where is the end if it's only imitation after of imitation of imitation of imitation there's nothing of substance anymore yeah there's no original yeah. reference anymore right it's like there's no starting point yeah absolutely it i mean there's some kind of like bizarre and i cannot believe i'm about to bring this up on my podcast <laughs> to you to like this like full-blown artist but like 50 shades of gray right <laughs> um, that was like a, a twilight fan fiction did you know that, that that's how it started i think i read it and she was a mormon or something like yeah 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some background that was horribly like misogynist and uh... totally. And she read Twilight, loved it, and wanted to write this like fan fiction of you know some sexy, controlling, cold weirdo and his like virginal you know protege thing. How sexy and... is that? I know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, I don't, I don't understand why it was so popular at all. Yeah. Um, but that, that's a really, I think, interesting, um, and maybe if I thought about it more before bringing it up, I would actually have somewhere to go with this, but like, that's an imitation of a thing that then even became more popular than the thing itself. But let me, uh, yeah, let me jump on that because I yeah, think yeah. this is really, this is also something that I suffer under a lot is that it's really hard to bring in originality into an existing system existing mm. system like um i'm also like i don't watch or i stopped watching tv when i moved i don't know like 17 or something because i couldn't stand it anymore like mm. just uh, i mean like tv is often of course like worse than movies but also the movies are just always the same story like structurally And this kind of like structure of story we've been telling us since, I don't know, since Gilgamesh, like how long is that? 3000 years ago, we've been, we're telling us the same story and just telling it just with little differences, but always with the same outcome and with the same kind of like um, expectation, of a expectation of a story when we go into the story. Like there has to mm -hmm. be some kind of satisfaction drawn from hearing a story from mm -hmm. that experience that we go into when we listen to a story. Mm -hmm. And when that turns around and is something completely different, then people get really irritated. I remember um, reading, I think it was some a collection of fairy tales from Ainu. There was like people like um, who've been living in Japanese islands for a very long time. Um, fairy tales that don't have something like a moral oh, they're, wow, just, wow. they're just stories of there's also nothing really happening it's just like this lady goes into the room and then there's the spider ghost and uh, you read it and it makes you uncomfortable as shit because you're not learning anything from it yeah. you're like why yeah. do I it's like it really makes you uncomfortable and then there's also like I make a lot like I have my boyfriend is also making art and he's been going through the like he's in a, in a different section of the art mar art market he's like um, his works work very differently and he's very successful with what he's doing and he doesn't um, so he stands by me when I'm making a lot of works and I always at some point I'm fed up with what I'm doing because I see so many references to a lot of things hmm. like I'm doing this right now because I've seen that before and I want to do actually something that I've that does not do the same thing that doesn't create the same narrative that does not look like something um, and then people really don't understand it yeah If you if you go if you go with um, if you really try to make something that is 
has a certain distance to references that are very normal in, in, in the cultural field that you are in. Like you draw from theories or from imagery or from thoughts that are not often referenced within the arts, um, whatever storytelling that you're in. That is very novel. People are very uncomfortable to evaluate that. They cannot like put it into their categorization system and then they just this like difficult, difficult, difficult. I have so much to say on this because um I wrote a I wrote my second novel last uh, year and I am having the hardest time uh, getting anybody to pay attention to it or rather no not attention attention it gets and like when I send it off to independent presses or agents or whatever like the feedback like these people always write me back and the feedback is like yeah this is this is yeah the the writing is excellent or you know it's it's very unique but but you know and it's because I've there's no names in this novel it's set in this like complete illusory sort of strange Kafkaesque world there's different voices um I play with dictionary definitions throughout it um there's like these bodiless voices as well that that falsely narrate different things like it's it's very strange it's nice. deliberately very strange. Yeah, I've, I'm very proud of it. it. God, oh my God, it took everything out of me to create. <laughs> <laughs> it's really weird. Um, I would love to read that. It sounds very, um, very interesting to me. I would love to send it to you. Don't, don't say things like that to me. I'll, I'll take you up on them. <laughs> <laughs> I would, yeah, if you need, a, if you need a, someone else to check it, I would love to read that. I love strange things. I'm, I'm so proud of it. Um, and and nobody will want it because it won't sell. It's not comfortable. There's there is no. Is there a moral? I don't think so. I mean, it's it's going to be very individual what anybody takes out of it. Um, it was an attempt to bottle just raw experience with language, which going back to the beginning of our conversation is very difficult and demanded the breakdown of language to do it. You know, um, so. The fact that I have to write these like submission letters saying, you know, this is who I am. Um, this is who uh, somebody you already represent or who have already published that, you know, is maybe similar to me or has written something similar to me. Every time I'm like, I, I, no, there's not. Sorry. There, it, it's not my ego. It's just like, I, I haven't seen it yet, you know, so, and sorry for that. Um but I'm contacting you because you like poetry and I think that's about as close as it gets. <laughs> you know? like, nobody, nobody wants to take a chance. And I swear, if I had 20,000 Instagram followers, it would be a different story. Yeah, you have to be like kind of evaluated first by someone else and then there's like, it's horrible. Yeah, exactly. And like the, redu- the fact that the people who supposedly get into an industry because, you know, they love art or they love books and then are part of its systemic destruction and, you know, quantifying something, putting numbers on a piece of work. Uh, it's, it's so, it's so disappointing. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's very destructive and it's also humiliating, right? Because you, mm. you have to succumb to, um, yeah, to, to references that they might know in order to justify what you've been doing in a way, right? Like, yeah. Yeah, that's it, actually. That's the word, to justify your work. Yeah. You have to, unless, unless you already have that name, unless you already have that name or the money behind you, that's constantly what you're doing as a young creator is justifying why you do the things that you do and asking for permission to have space rather than somebody giving you the space to be like, well, let's see then. Come on, let's see. And I don't know how we support each other through it either. I don't know. I feel like we need like a, a young billionaire benefactor. We need Bezos to have like a socialist child. He'll <laughs> <laughs> be like, I've inherited billions. Here, let me fund everything. <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> but that's kind of like, that's where we're at at the moment, you know? Isn't that horrible? <laughs> yes. It's like, I mean, I, I see it like, I don't know. This is like rather on the private thing, but I um, these motivational speakers and this kind of like quotes that everywhere, like this billionaire who's worth so and so much money, this is what he says is like, what, 
are they are they cultural heroes like why mm. do they why is it important what they say like what can other people learn from it like what is is it is it the goal to be a billionaire like what is you know what is the value of all of this uh, if it isn't just that you accumulate an absurd amount of money that you as a f human physical being will not be able to are you going to eat it or what are you going to do with it like yeah. you know right but i think it's because we have an education system that doesn't value um people's creativity whatsoever so unless you're kind of like a stubborn person and like stubbornly um, keen to be an artist, stubbornly keen to be a writer, because that's what it takes is being absolutely pigheaded, you know, to be like, well, I'm, I'm just gonna go and do this thing. Yeah, like, I don't, I don't care about the rest of you. Um, privilege and, and, and stubbornness. Like, we don't have an education system that values anything like that. So, I mean, what can people aspire to? If people haven't had the opportunity to be nurtured or if people haven't had their creativity um celebrated there's nothing to aspire to apart from the collection of digits yeah 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 that's totally. it and it's um yeah i don't know like i don't when i was young i was like reading all of these like old novels that were like written in the 19th century and the beginning of 20th century before you know before the entire 20th century happened where so many things happened <laughs> and um I feel that was well, like it felt a little bit of a magical world because there were so more things to that were coming up and that were like. I mean, I'm not going back to the concept of honor because honor is a horrible system, um, concept, but there were so many other other things that came up in there. They were kind of like in the consideration of the people that were written about, like not only money but also all kinds of other things, and um, somehow I feel there is like all of this is yeah it's kind of like over covered by this digit kind of like thing and there is no other forms of virtue or like you know what i mean with cultural heroes there was like there were like yeah, these yeah. these cultural heroes in the 20th century as well right like the the singers that would i don't know sing about peace or whatever they were like larger ideas and and kind of like role models there were some they were good in something else than just accumulating money yeah yeah god you're so right you, there's one musician i'm thinking of i don't know if you've listened to him benjamin clementine no let me, let me write that down <laughs> oh you have you go oh my god listen to his song um london um he is a he's this incredible musician and poet and he used to skip school in London and go and hang out in the library and just like, you know, read all these old amazing poets and playwrights and whatever. And when he was 17, I think he left home and he just took the train to Paris and lived on the streets or like in hostels, you know, he was homeless for years and he would busk and he would sing and sing and sing. And because he never had any formal training or never, you know, any access to like community, he kind of developed this very strange, unique style. Um, and he was discovered essentially, like on a metro one day when he was singing. Yeah, 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 he was discovered. And this song London is about this sort of pain that we're describing here, you know, like the fact that to get anywhere, you have to receive help from a system that is going to sacrifice others in order for you to get ahead. And um, nice. he still has this very idiosyncratic way of, of being and of thinking, you know, he performs uh, barefoot, um, he kind of mumbles into the mic, bet like between these huge operatic sets, he just kind of, you know, mumbles and tells bad jokes. Like he, he's not, he's not Beyonce, he's not a performer. He's, he's, he's a poet, he's an artist. Um, and he's like, to me, that's, that he's a cultural hero. He's one of the people that like, just every six months I like read his Wikipedia page, even though I know it off by heart, just like, oh man, your life, it's so cool what you're doing. <laughs> 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 or um, Michaela Cole, who did I May Destroy You, that series. I don't know that one. I'm right. going to write that down as well. Michaela Cole, I May Destroy You. Holy shit, that might just be the best piece of, you know, television ever made. Um, 
think I heard uh, the title actually. It was it was yeah it went mad on like the internet. People just yeah were blown away by it as as they should be. Um, but she's somebody as well. It's not it's not exactly a rags to riches story, but just like a, a believable story. You know she she wrote she worked she got her mates were involved in that work in that world. And gradually, you know, because she was very good at what she did and she was lucky, you know, she got into this place where she's now making her own stuff and it's phenomenal. Um, and she's just like super cool as well. Nice. <laughs> so they are there. They, they, they are there. But like, why would those people be a hero for anybody that doesn't already identify as some kind of, you know, artist or writer? Is it accessible? Yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, like, I think this is this point of, or like, what you said before, like, you, you need to be like a pig hat. Pig headed. Yeah. And in, in the beginning to make it, and on the way, it's like really, really hard to, to endure all of these like uh, insecurities and all of them difficult difficulties that come along because the other side of it is of course like if only you are able to to see what makes sense in there like isn't it just like a, a horrible narcissistic kind of like um i don't know Activity. how you call that but yeah yeah somehow um yeah. but then i don't know how it is for you but for me it's really hard to do something else from now like I have learned how to develop thoughts that I can make them into artworks that kind of convey the things that I want to do, um, the ideas that I have. And um, this practice of like developing thoughts and putting them into works is like becomes such a big part of me that I feel like I don't want to go like I don't want to spend less time on it. It's like mm -hmm. it's become such a big part of like how I am right now. Um, so even though there is this, this question of monetization and how I'm going to survive on that and if it's always going to be right and how I'm going to be uh, dealing with being part of a system that I really don't like and like being directly in touch with a group of society that I really don't want to support. Um, mm. It's really hard to turn away from this mode of being that you are when you develop things on your own, like you also do your writing, you are developing this, this podcast is really amazing. Um, yeah. So I think there's also, I mean, it's, again, it's like hard to, to put a value on it and it's hard to quant quantify it, but there is a kind of like inherent like value and just being this, creative self that person that you are that is like making things the way that you do it and um yeah but again it would be easier to to put that into a concrete language and into a concrete value as soon as we as there would be a way to quantify it no or to like remunerate it like to pay for that mm -hmm, mm -hmm, in a way mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I find that, um, you know, people who really commit to to the life of being an artist or a writer, I, I think you're all incredibly brave. Um, I find a sense of security in being puritanical, like the tyranny of purity. You know, like I, I don't expect to make money from my writing, so I can just I can just write. Um, and I find other ways. Well, I say I find other ways to make money, but... Like, <laughs> I spent all my time doing all this free shit. So. <laughs> you know, like it's, you know, it, it, yeah, my purity gets in the way of my finances for sure. My mom is terrified I'm not going to have a pension. She's like, but what are you going to do when you're older? I'm like, Susan, the world will be on fire by then. You know, just don't worry about it. This was always my answer as well. <laughs> <laughs> this is the best answer. Yeah, totally. I, climate change or the breakdown of the welfare system. Like there, there will be no totally. states. <laughs> It's already crumbling so much, it's going to be gone anyway. 
Yes, exactly, exactly. So like we're all going to be dead or we're all going to be lining up to, you know, euthanize ourselves or whatever. So um, and there's there's a freedom in that kind of there's no point in having to play the system because it's not going to be there in a couple of decades anyway. Um, it, I think that it's we might sort of be the um, depending on how much of humanity survives and looks back on this time. But we might be this kind of bizarre second beat generation, actually. Those of Maybe. Us. Yeah. maybe right yeah can we you know what it was it was the same for them you know the the mode of life that had been offered to their parents was no longer available they had to travel around in order to find work they used that work to support a lot of their other work their art their writing whatever Kerouac's an asshole because he came from wealth so he doesn't count but like you know the rest of the, yeah that's kind of what we are us young creatives in this world um but I think it's an awful thing to have to ask young people. Um, not only do you dare to reach down into the depths of yourself and express that in an attempt to express something universal and something human. And while you're doing that, also, by the way, how are you going to make money out of it? Yeah, it's, do everything at the same time. Like, yeah. what you're doing is great that you are doing, but don't overreach because you also have to do all of the other stuff. And it's like, no. Yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. And yeah, I don't, I don't, personally, I don't know how to do it. If any artist or writer is out there listening um, that has, like, the, the secret key to, to that cognitive dissonance, our emails are... <laughs> totally, yeah. I, I, need, I need a lot of, like, how do you call it, like business advice on how to be yeah. successful and not being like a business person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would be a useful BuzzFeed article. BuzzFeed, if you're listening, how to. <laughs> <laughs> totally. So, but you said it, it was your second novel, right? Mm. So you, you already got one out. No, 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 no. I wrote it. I wrote my first one when I was, um, how old was I? 22? And I, <laughs> I thought it was so good, um, and I self-published because I was like, I, I'm not, I'm not even gonna try. I don't even care. I don't, I don't want to be part of the system. And then, after I wrote this, which was like, a, I mean, this, this, this recent one completely changed my relationship to language. Um, and so I went back and I reread the first one. I was like, oh my God, this is a pile of shite. <laughs> so I took it down and I rewrote it. And thinking in the capitalist way, I was like, okay, I can rewrite this. And it's actually st like, it's still commodifiable. You know, it's like, it's, um, there's a, there's an anti-heroine. Um, it's, it's, you know, anti-capitalist, but it, it fits into that kind of dystopia genre. So I could sell that. I, you know, haven't rewrote it, just left it. I can't be bothered. I can't just, it's, it's so do soul destroying to, to even attempt it. It would be actually interesting. I mean, like just now thinking how to make it even the, like making formats that are not there. Like, you know, and I often work the way that I revisit a work. Like I often, when I make works, I have an idea and a tribe and a thought. And I make it, I have the process in my mind from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. And I make it until this point. And then when I finished it, I don't know what I've done. Like, I cannot talk about it. I cannot sum it up. Half a year later, I will be able to put it into works. And then, like, most probably two years later, I'm going to make a second version of the work. So there's, like, mostly, like, at least two versions of each work that I have. And I like to show... Like, I never showed them together, but I think also for your novel, if you overworked it, like, to make it even more strange and not like something that has been there before, maybe don't swap it, but just like line it somehow and make both visible at the same time or like perceivable at the same time might be also interesting to show the I process. Think, yeah, I think that's like a visual art project, actually. I have a, a, a <laughs> book of poems. No, but it's fascinating. I have a book of poems by Sylvia Plath, Ariel. I have one of the, the editions that was published. And it has, you know, the poems in text. And like the last 40 pages are the drafts with her annotations. 
like as she was changing. So you can see the work in progress. And I think, and you know what? Like how amazing, I was 17 when I picked up that book, 16. And how amazing it was as a young writer to be like, oh, she doesn't just, you know, give birth to the finished product. Like this was crap and she made it good. You know, like like, there's a process here, you know, like that's the kind of stuff we need to be seeing. And I think then that kind of answers like the the accessibility question and then maybe the quantifiable or the, the value question, you know, it's, it's extremely intimidating um, and alienating, even as somebody that's like, I'm a writer, I studied a bit of philosophy, I like to chat shit, <laughs> sorry, I should, I like, I like <laughs> to talk about stuff, you know, I read The Economist, whatever, I'm, I'm fairly up to speed with different things, with a variety of things, but like, I walk into an art gallery and I'm like, I don't know what any of it means. I don't know what I meant to think. You know, I'm like the person reading the little plaque underneath the thing, like, right, okay, what is this exactly? (laughs) I get like, I I don't know what to think when just looking at something. Um, Most I'll get like a a feminist interpretation, you know, that's the the school of thought I was trained in, you know, at university. Um, So even for me, it's intimidating. Like, because I mean, the the works that, that you sent me, you know, exercises in macroeconomics. And I was like... Oh my god! I'll put I'll put a picture up on the screen here in the video, like, wow! I was like, that looks really, really interesting, and I I I was like, I don't know, I don't I don't know what to think about it. Like uh, I think so many things, but nothing clearly. And then I wrote down, and you had the paragraph, and I was like, oh, thank God! Here's the explanation, <laughs> <laughs> and now I can like engage in a discourse about it. So for somebody else that doesn't, you know. Yeah, it's not clear, right? It's like it's what the fuck. Yeah, I know. No, but not not about that not about that specific work or any specific work, but like to see the process. Like this is where I started and this is where we've arrived. So like you can come on the journey with somebody it would just be like so fascinating, I think. Or, yeah, <sighs> totally. And I mean also I mean when you when you said that with like you have basically two versions of that book. Uh, I was a little bit, I don't know, like format wise, I was a little bit thinking about the way that like Bibles are always like published, you know, they have, you have like this um, kind mm-hmm. of like thick line between. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also, I don't like having this kind of like practice where I always overwork works again and again. I don't like this idea of a finished work. I can tell that the process is like finished at some point and I'm not going to return to that work most probably. But I don't know if this is like, if this is the only finished version of it. And, you know, it's like, it's like this, this idea of an end form just feels very alien to me somehow. Oh my God, totally. And also the fact that like, okay, one of one of my books somebody else could take it and make it 10 times better somebody else could take it and you know come up with the ending that I struggled to achieve because I didn't want to let go of the character or whatever like it's you know everyone is in relationship with a piece of art um as Heidegger would say and it's yeah it's absurd to think that okay this is this is the thing that I'm putting out into the universe because like we we haven't we haven't established exactly where creation comes from we haven't established we don't even know how to make a human being you know from scratch so the fact that like we there's no finished product that we know how to put into the world so why why would it be the same with art you know and it's it can't be finished because everybody's in communion with it themselves you know absolutely totally I completely agree with what you're saying <laughs> <laughs> it's like yeah I was also thinking like when you were just saying that with with like we don't can't even make a human from scratch is that this way I don't know if you were educated the same way but I was always like educated in in this idea that like the world that we are like born into is a kind of like end process of a longer process and this is where we add and this is where it stopped basically saying that evolution was the process until now and just totally not talking about the future and that we're still within the process of evolution and that humans are going to look different in the future and that we are right now also in a process of that like we're mutating all the time and then like i don't know maybe have like no arms in the future because we don't need them anymore because we do everything with eye contact interfaces or whatever <laughs> right and it's like understanding all of this that that we are not that we are not at the peak kind of like of history that 
but we are actually changing still and all of this is ongoing like changed my mind so much and also like made me think about works totally differently like i personally love what cooks it i mean like of course we're all cooking we're all eating but i love that when someone is cooking something good for you and you eat it then this becomes part of your body Mm. And this is like, this is an alteration of someone that I would like to achieve with my art. Like, I want to go with my work into your mind and change your perception and your world to a degree that I can do with cooking for you, where you eat what I've done and it becomes your flesh and it becomes your blood and everything. And I love that. I love this kind of like transitionality that... Um, we do with all kinds of exchanges, not only with good, but also with thoughts. Like you say things that inspire me a lot. And I hope vice versa. Oh yeah, vice versa. <laughs> <laughs> and I love like how this, this kind of like this, this, this idea of a fixed corpus that is kind of like has um, finite borders is not, we are not able to hold that up anymore in a kind of like more molecular kind of like ways of understanding the world. And um, yeah, coming back to how I think about my artworks that are always changing. And then like, I also always change descriptions and I have to, for example, um, this work that you were just mentioning, like exercises in macroeconomics, like I, I made it once the way that I wanted to do it. And then, um, I sold it and someone really liked it and wanted to have it as well. And for me, that was like a great chance to make it anew and make it like a new version of it, like make something, put it to another level because I made it once, so it has to evolve, right? Mm. So it becomes something different. Um, and then I was like developing it with them. And I think for them, it was a little bit weird because they have this idea that there's this artist who's like yeah. this... Yeah. I don't want to use the term because it's a horrible term, uh, but it's kind of like creative genius and they do this thing because they think this is the right shape of it and this has to be and this is the end of it and this is what I sell to you, mm. um, which is totally not the case. And they were part of the making and like a new version of it and I loved it uh, because also they have to live with it and not I, you know, when I mm. sell it to them. Then. But um, I think especially for visual artists, there's this idea of, this un, how can I say it? Like this, this genius idea that there's this kind of like, I don't know, solid monolithic kind of like alien kind of not like everyone else kind of like being that has, yeah, you know? It, it's so blokey. <laughs> no, but it is. No, but it, it's, this, it's this image of like, you know, the Italian painter, you know, in his attic, cursed and tortured by his genius. Um, and kind of in these like ecstatic or fervent bouts of expression that are inhuman. You know, he paints for 46 hours and he passes out. And it's like, that's, that's not, that's, that's, do you know what kind of a person you have to be to be so privileged that you can live like that? You're not looking after kids, I can tell you that. You're not looking after family members. Like, that's not the, the life of a caretaker, ever. Like the, yeah, yeah. The, the male philosophers and artists and everything who were, lived like that and who developed that trope, it was because they were given that position in society where they were removed. And maybe that's where everything went wrong, actually. I'm totally just spitballing here, but like going back to politics and how it's the art of like the complex relationship of, of everything, like we removed the people who were making the biggest decisions. We took the artist out of all the relationships so he could just focus on his art. We took the philosopher and put him in a cave in ancient Greece so that he could just focus on what's wrong with the world and like, you know, figuring it out. And it's like, it's, it's created this completely alien way of, of being able to behave. Yeah, and or inhuman, just, unsocial, yeah. Yeah, totally. yeah, it's mad. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this whole creative genius thing. It's like, well, everybody, I firmly believe everybody is capable of creation. And, absolutely. you know, we've come up with a couple of genres or not genres, but like forms, you know, you've got your books and those get subdivided into different things. You've got your painting that's get subdivided and your drawing and, you know, all your film and whatever. But even like film, you know, that was an art form that wasn't around. Um, I'm not going to say a date because I'll show how ignorant I am. But like, you know, before, 
it's it's new. I don't know shit anyway, so <laughs> I won't I won't correct you on that. But it and it is exactly what you're saying, like this idea of like we're always actually in the middle, you know. I I only realized it and honest, I swear to God, it was about three weeks ago. I was like, for the first time in my life, oh, this isn't the end product. We're not living in the end product or the end times. This is the middle of something else. Um, because you're right. Maybe we won't have arms. Maybe there'll be another art form that we, you know, becomes the way of expressing ourselves. Um, of course, we're not figuring everything out. Like it's so arrogant to think that the these are the brains that humans were meant to have you know this, this is where we've been <laughs> yeah, <aiming exactly>. at. <laughs> what are you chatting about <laughs> yeah totally it's so it's so stupid i mean like yeah like everything there but also just like coming back to this genius and this is like totally what you're saying like women's are women are never geniuses i never heard that someone calls like or that women were called geniuses and mm-hmm. in, in that term how it is used mm-hmm. yeah but as you say, they're like totally, re- <laughs> they're totally removed from society. Yeah. Like, and yeah. that's what makes them, and they also have to suffer or whatever. And I don't know. Oh yeah. All that thing about like artists suffering is like everybody suffers. Um, that's, that's kind of what being alive is until we figure out what dark matter is, <laughs> you know, um, cause that's probably where God is hiding. Um, so, well, you know, just stop att- attributing it to like, it's, <sighs> The burden of existence does not fall on just a few male shoulders in a generation. It's everybody's burden and it's everybody's joy. And like going back to, you know, exercises in macroeconomics, like what a fantastically political thing to do to remake it with the buyer, to have that relationship, to involve that person from the beginning, to, 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 and also to evolve it. Like... I don't know much about, you know, really, really famous artists, but Picasso didn't seem like the type who, if if somebody had said, hey, can you paint that again? Because I really like it. I want to buy it. He'd be like, there can only be one of those. You know, he just seems like that kind of prick. (laughs) Yeah, he's, yeah, totally. (laughs) He's the stereotypical kind of, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Where, you know, not falling into like gender, but into, you know, the kind of, um, religious understanding or spiritual understanding of 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 masculine and feminine what a fantastically feminine way to to approach um creation with ma- the second version of exercises in macroeconomics i'm very happy that you say that that makes me very happy mm, i think so well it's like if you have a kid you know like you don't expect to pop out the same one do you you know <laughs> it's, it's number two <laughs> let's try again shall we <laughs> Oh, I'm sure all parents right now listening to this are shaking their heads. <laughs> mm. Linda, I could talk to you all day, literally all day. Um, but I think we're going to wrap it up there. And what I would actually like to suggest is that in a couple of months or maybe before your show or whatever, we choose maybe one of the themes that we've discussed here today and like really go, go into it in further detail or something. I would love... What I'm saying is I would love to have you back on the show. That would be so amazing. <laughs> like, I, I really, I really love the conversation with you. <laughs> Me too. Can we just do that every week now? I don't know. Could but I really, I really enjoy <laughs> Yeah, totally. <laughs> no, I really enjoy it. And I would love to, to just go. You, you are, you guide the line and I'm following. Awesome. Oh, that, it would be amazing. So tell me, to wrap up, who would you like to platform? Um, she is, she, it's, it's a lady, like a a person that I really admire for her films. She's a filmmaker. Um, and she makes very, like, humorous, but very critical, uh, films that are often described as feminists. Mm -hmm. Mm Um, yeah. And she's, uh, should I say her name or like, okay, it's a German name. So I'm going to say it very German. Her name is Marlene Denningmann. Melina Enigma. 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 That's a good way. Yeah, nice. <laughs> <laughs> I will, of course, give you all the contacts. And Thank you. Uh, I think you would enjoy a conversation with her a lot. I'm sure. I'm sure. Oh, Linda, this has been amazing. Thank you so, so, so much. Thank you very much. It was a big pleasure. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> it really was for me. Hello, everyone. Wasn't that just like mind-blowing, right? <laughs> you can find Linda and her fascinating work at lindahavenstein.com. She has an ongoing exhibition at Kiz Windows in Berlin and simultaneous shows from September 17th to 19th at Berlin's Unblock Fair Art Fair, Stockholm's Market Art Fair, and Amsterdam's Unseen Art Fair. Keep your eyes peeled also for her solo show at Dorothy Nilsson Gallery in Berlin from January 21st to March 5th next year. Also, before you go, don't forget to leave Platform Enterprise a five-star rating. And if you really love the show, then do please consider getting a paid subscription over at platformenterprise.com. All right. Thank you so much for supporting the podcast, everyone. See you next week.